Hi everybody, it's Russ from My Hammers Eleven. I hope you're all safe and well. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing and hitting that bell icon so you're made aware of any time we put new content on. Um, we have videos going up daily, but sometimes two, three times a day, and I won't miss any of the great stories and memories um, that we're talking about and categorising. Today's guest, you'll recognise him, a comedian, folk singer, entertain the nation for. I wouldn't want to say how many years, Richard. Uh, it's Richard Digest. How are you? How are you, Richard? Well, I'm all right, but um, in a lockdown, you do things like gardening that you've never really been that mad about. Oh, and you walk into a tree, and oh, uh, that's branch one and that's branch two. And they so wanted to be on the telly that they kept their scabs on just for you. Oh, that's very kind of you. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, I, I, I feel honoured. I feel touched. <laughs> so, feel apart from, <laughs> yeah, so you feel pain, yeah. Apart from the uh, the gardening incidents, how is um, how's lockdown been treating you? It's um, a weird, weird, weird world we live in. It's very strange, Russ, because I'm a performer, and uh, yeah. my hunch is I could probably never perform again in in the usual sense. You know, mm. if you take a gig like. Um, like the Queens at Hornchurch, for example, you know, I just don't fancy playing there again with no. two seats empty, blah, blah, blah. It kills the atmosphere, you know. Yeah. And um, and so I'm really working on soundtrack stuff. I've been working with Bill Bryce and the author mm -hmm. and um, for audio books, really. So it's, it's a really a studio-based life now as opposed mm -hmm. to performing. I'm already missing it, and I haven't been out the house for five months um and that's a bit drab for me you know i saw my daughter my youngest daughter for the first time on sunday and it's been five months so it's like uh but i'm the same as everyone else i'm doing my best to get through you know? yeah exactly um i live in horn church so i live about i live about two minutes away from the queen's theater so i, oh. I know exactly what you mean there you yeah. go. <laughs> I know what you mean. It must be hard. I've spoken to a lot of um, a lot of performers, uh, a lot of comedians as well, actually, and it's the same yeah. thing because you, you you obviously as a performer you feed off that crowd interaction as well, don't you? And it's atmospheric, it. Russ, yeah. you know, and uh, you know it, it would almost like be playing the church for me, you know, and yeah. uh, and I just think it's probably not going to change now. Certainly not in my lifetime, and so mm -hmm. I just find other things and. Uh, I can't say that I'm I've found a solution, but I'm doing my best to keep creatively active, which is what I am, you know, and um we'll see how it goes. But there's nothing wrong with starving. No, 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 exactly. Exactly. <laughs> is there a rough? I could, I could. If only, if only, I was thinking about get, coming out with one of these uh, lockdown pods, but it hasn't really worked. But um yeah, it's yeah, it's 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 I mean it's weird isn't it i mean I, I actually i sort of in a weird way i sort of enjoyed it you know because like it's not I, you know not having time to obviously i commute into work every day in london and now i'm here with my daughter she's not at school uh and you know and it's nice how it's nice to sort of spend some proper time together and, and not and also not be forced to you know when it comes to weekends and the, the, the the wife goes oh let's go and let's go shopping or let's go here and you haven't been able to for the last few months so it's been well, nice I, sort of i said to someone the other day that that weekends have gone i don't yeah. think of a saturday you know um saturday always for me was um uh i wrote a book with chris kamara um called footy notes about football trivia and um, saturday afternoons for me was always sitting down soccer saturday yeah. um Cammy would be on messing things up as usual <laughs> and I'd give him I'd text him and give him a word he had to put in um oh, wow. in, into a commentary and uh, I think the best one was green lighthouse <laughs> and uh and he went okay and then it was I think it's Spurs I think and he said oh and Jeff the ball came over and the goalkeeper rose like a huge green lighthouse and he like, yes. uh, uh and I used to enjoy them silly Saturdays, and, yeah. uh, and they've gone, you know. Yeah. But um, it's the, for the future of my children and my grandchildren, you know, that I'm more concerned about. I've, I've had a really good yeah. had the best life in the world, so I can't complain. 
Mm. Yeah, I know what you mean. And and also, you know, when it comes to Saturdays, yeah, soccer Saturdays. Now at the moment, it's soccer every day, isn't it? It's like I can't keep up with all the all the games at the moment. No, it's not football as I know it. And uh, and when you asked me very kindly to appear with you on this, uh, I just thought, do you know what? I'm going to enjoy making my notes and enjoy football as it was. You know, and I'm an umpy bloke with West Ham, you know, because uh, I loved the the bowling and uh, I lived just down the road from the bowling. And um, I was very anti the London Stadium anyway. And uh, and there was a guy uh, um, commentating on an Everton game and just the other day. And he said uh, to the other commentator, do you think Goodison Park will ever see fans in the stadium again? The bloke said, I, "I really don't know, and yeah. uh, and I don't I don't know either. You know, it's it's just like a chasm of practice matches. That's how I see yeah. it. Yeah, you know? no, it's yeah, not. You know, is it? You know, nah. It's weird. It is weird. I mean, I, I you know, obviously, uh, you know, I'm I'm fortunate of being one of the one of the three hundred there each game, and it is weird. And you know, it's it, and again, it's about just thinking about things differently you know i you know we would obviously we, we put all the videos and the music and we keep you know keep the atmosphere but there's no one there for to do it and it's like you know we're like oh oh we've got to put the music on we've got to put the video on and we're like for who you know and it's like no one here for my own benefit i sense that would be the same if i was to walk on at the queens you know it, yeah. it's a very similar thing and i actually don't want to do it so uh, um yeah there you go <laughs> there you go no i know but it's uh yeah and obviously we've got some a few massive games for us um coming up and uh yeah it's at least i mean you know we've really with football on you you've got something new to talk about and because yeah. of the the plethora of games there's always something new you know it's always like you know you look at it you go god the season's over next sunday it's like <laughs> when did that we played nine games in about four weeks it's absolutely yeah. mental then they can all go on holiday again after having five months on holiday and uh, yeah hopefully win some games next year <laughs> yeah well exactly and I, I think is it mid-september they're looking at kick-starting the season again i mean there is yeah. talk about doing starting with a i don't know 20 percent or something like of fans i think some fans would be better than no fans to be honest there yes because, I, I do agree with that russ yeah and and, and actually you know, being in the being in the London Stadium makes it a bit easier. I think social distancing wise, because it's a newer stadium and it's all the bowl yes. system. They well, can do totally, stuff. You're yeah. socially anyway at the London Stadium. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's, it's quite a big place, but um, no, we'll see what it is. And 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 obviously for you, Richard, you know, being a West Ham fan, you know, clearly it was a geographical decision for you to become a West Ham fan. Yes, yes, I was born in Plasto, Howard's Road, yeah. Plasto, and um, uh, I, I moved from uh, from Custom House, uh, uh, Mortlake Road in um, Canning Town, well, Custom House really, um, to East Ham um, due to slum clearance, <laughs> and um, strangely, my mum and dad took, took me with them, uh, which was a surprise, and uh, I ended up almost walking distance to upton park wow. but not quite uh, um the the number 15 bus came from the white horse in east ham um, around down barking road and it was a penny halfpenny, would you believe when i first went to west ham and sometimes i'd walk and buy some chips other than that i got on a bus which i'll tell you about when i get to my number nine. Oh, fantastic i'm looking forward to your 11 richard particularly <laughs> I really am because yeah. as I said before we recorded you know yes it's you know it's nice to for, you know to document this stuff but it's nice for me because like I'm learning about a lot of players and a lot of um games and experiences that people have which obviously I I was a bit naive too because like you yeah. know and and so it's it's lovely you know it's like when we I know someone's talking about John Charles and I go and you know uh -huh. in, find out about him or, or johnny sissons or johnny Aries, you know all these players that i had no idea of um oh, I'm going back further than that oh, I, I love it. <laughs> i'll tell you the first game um and i had to really uh, rack my brains i'm not even sure i'm right but i'm sort yeah. of right was 1955 how about that wow. um, and i used to have charles buckland's football monthly delivered every month and there was pictures on my bedroom wall like 
probably a lot of people of my age, you know. Yeah. And um, and we had Blackpool in the cup, and I just so so wanted to see Stanley Matthews, and um, he had the crappiest game you could ever <laughs> wish to see, and uh, and West Ham beat Blackpool in I think it was the third round of the FA Cup that year. But I yeah. saw my first ever legend, which was Stanley Matthews. Fantastic. I remember him saying, you're Richard Dyson's, aren't you? As he ran by. And, I'm sure uh, he did. Yeah, he did. He's got all your albums, which is amazing. Yeah. I've only five. <laughs> Oh, I love it. It's funny, isn't it? It's it's true. I remember, like, again, you know, when when we've at West Ham seeing sort of players that you know. Remember when when we're Argentina played at Upton Park and and Messi yeah. was on the pitch at West Ham, and you're like, <laughs> yeah. this is this is incredible, you know, because we'd never obviously we'd never see a player of Messi's caliber, yeah, you know, in the claret and blue, but it was like incredible seeing his yeah. player. And I know. Amazing. West Ham used to have games. Um, uh, against what they called the All Star Eleven, sure. and I think it was once a season. And I remember speaking to John Lyle once. I uh, I went fishing with him up in Ipswich, and uh, um, and we were just sitting there. And I said, I remember John when West Ham played for the first time in white shirts with a claret and blue band. And he went, I remember that as well. And I said, it was the All Star Eleven. He said, No, it wasn't. I said, It was. It, because it was announced that it was a new strip, a continental strip, as they called it. And uh, and so me and John just went to war about the first time West Ham ever played in those white shirts, oh, which I think it sort of became an away strip for a little while. But uh, yeah. I remember very fondly my boys running out in this brand new strip. And of course, then it was down to the sports shop in Barking Road to see yeah. if you could buy a replica. You know, uh, great, great, great memories. Yeah. As indeed of John Lyle, who was one of the very best. Of course, no, I know what you mean he's. It's just one of those things, isn't it? I mean, it, and, and you're right. It, not just that, but you have. I mean, I remember. I don't necessarily remember what season things happened in, but I remember it based on the shirts. So yeah, it's yeah. like you know, and, and players. So it's like you know, for me, like Paladin Kanye would always be in sort of that that one with the, the big collar and and yeah, uh, yeah. and you know, and it's like I, I see uh, West Ham have just announced that the new. The new away strip, which was the old blue and and yeah, two right. claret strip, which I love as a, as a strip. And I remember yeah. when we had the SBO bet, Jack Collison wearing the long sleeve version. It's funny, isn't it? How you sort of so I don't remember the season it was in, but I remember it by the shirts. And it, I is, love, oh, it is you do all these things and you do all this television and gigs and things, and yet you still remember Tommy Taylor running out of his collar up, um, the one of our centre halves of years ago, and you just think. Why do I remember that? I bet he doesn't yeah. even remember that. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's and that's what it's all about, isn't it? That's what it's about, memory. I mean, you know, I, I say it every episode, Richard, but we're not in it for the football. Uh, <laughs> we've backed the wrong horse if that was the case. But it is Absolutely. about the memories and it is about you know communities but you know, you going fishing with John Lyle, it's about yeah, me talking to the other day, um, Addy from the Indian Hammers, which honestly, which just was an incredibly humbling experience, you know, oh, yeah, and, yeah. and all that type of stuff. It's just, uh, you know, I, I think we're biased, but I just think we have the best fan base. I really do. It's just, Without question. I mean, there yeah. was, a, of course, we, we all know this, that what West Ham was everyone's second favourite team yeah. around the country. I can't say it's like that now, but that they were because they were so homebred. You yeah. know, and um, uh, and we had a reputation for uh, great football, bringing players through, and um, I don't see that these days. But that's in my memory cells. You know, the the fact that we were so respected and so loved, and um, and never crowd trouble because everyone used to love. <laughs> I know it changed, but everyone loved the West Ham fans because we were following a fantastic team that everyone yeah. said. It didn't support Man United or support West Ham, you know. And the yeah. times I used to hear that, and uh, and I keep thinking, yeah. And I support West Ham, and I go through all that drudgery and and so on. Yeah. Uh, didn't want to do that with this particular chat. I just wanted to go. You know what you mean? Where is my brain taking me on this little journey? I don't know. You and yeah. I. Are Let's, 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 let's start the journey, Rich. Let's start the journey because I'm 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 really I'm really looking forward to this. Right, so we'll do year eleven, and and I will let you just go 
any order you want just because I, I've, you know, I can imagine there's a path and I would want to see to, to divert it by me sort of going, Oh, let's talk about this play. I, I no, leave it to you. Richard. No, you just interrupt. I don't have a problem with that. No, no, no. no, no, you, no. You, you start Richard. I, I'm, and I, I'm all ears. But what I've done actually, Russ is, is I've gone back to the days when shirts had um, sensible numbers on um, <laughs> because, you know, I, I've no, I haven't picked up a, on a squad player who's wearing 111 you know, I've um, I've decided to go one to eleven because I'm old enough to remember when that was the case. Yes. And uh, and number one, um, uh, when you asked me to do this for you, uh, it would be very very easy to pick my favourites. Yeah. Um, Phil Parks, for example, Mervyn Day, even you know. Um, but I haven't gone down that route. My number one is actually Bobby Ferguson. Oh yes. And, uh, I'd like to tell you why. Ferguson, when we signed him from Kilmarnock, he was the world's most expensive goalkeeper. Mm. And not only that, but he was Scottish, which meant that he couldn't catch corners. And he came from Kilmarnock. And me and my dad went to see um, a friendly, because part of the deal of Ferguson coming to West Ham was that West Ham got a friendly at Upton Park against Kilmarnock, you see. And out comes this Bobby Ferguson, who we all knew we'd signed, but we'd never seen him before. And it it was a sort of an honour for him that he would play his last game for Kilmarnock against his new club. Wow, yeah, it's really weird. Out comes Ferguson, is wearing red. Now, goalkeepers didn't wear red. Uh, they wore yellow jumpers or green jumpers. And don't forget the year before that, Gordon Banks wore yellow in 66. Yeah. Uh, and... and Normally, it was a green polo neck jumper or whatever it was. <clears throat> and this bloke runs out, probably because he's Scottish, I don't know, um, with red jumper, red shorts and red socks. And I was standing in the chicken run next to my dad. And I went, that's him, dad. That's our new goalkeeper. My dad said, he looks like a pillar box. I said, he does, but he's our, our new goalie. So the game starts and West Ham with our new goalkeeper in goal for Kilmarnock, beat them 7-0. And I think Jeff Hurst, if I'm not mistaken, scored six goals. And my dad turned to me and said, that's our new goalkeeper. Yeah. And I never thought there would there would be a worse one, to be honest. Uh, I think there was. Uh, I'm trying to rack my brains here. I'm ad-libbing like mad. But we had a goalie called Noel Dwyer once. Um, and um, and he had um, lard on his hands. He just couldn't catch nothing. <laughs> um, but, yeah, my number one, purely because it rem reminds me of standing with my dad in the sacred yeah. run, um, right-hand side, you know, uh, I thought I'd choose Bobby Ferguson, number yeah, one. No, yeah, like it. Yeah. yeah. Good shout. No, I, and that's the thing is, and it is about the stories, isn't it? About the memories and, and how players remember a certain time where you were, uh, you your memory of your dad. That's a brilliant memory. It is such a West Ham thing, though, isn't it? You know, yeah. it's just like, it doesn't, nothing's changed, you know, like that in terms of just no. the, the way it would always happen. And what right, with the on. young people, well, younger than me watching, uh, I just thought I'd, I'd just mention the games because. Uh, um, Ferguson, for example, had 240 games for West Ham and uh, signed in 1967. So it's a nice little bit of history yeah. about how we're, and it. And we had a goalie from Scotland before that called um, Laurie Leslie, who was a phenomenal goalkeeper, got kicked in the head by Bobby Tamblin of Chelsea and knocked him out clean cold. And in them days, of course, they went off, especially big, burly Scottish goalkeepers. Uh, he went off. He stuck a bandage around his head and he came back on after about <laughs> 10 minutes. And, uh, and you just think, and it wouldn't happen no more. No. Yeah, it just no. wouldn't happen. But no, you're yeah, right. guessing that I was a goalkeeper myself, as I shall explain as we go through. And yeah. so I always had um, my eye on West Ham goalkeepers because it's what I wanted to be. I was yeah. desperate to be a West Ham goalie. I had trials for Lake Norium, which didn't count. It was like one up from a paper round, really. But... Um, but I, I longed to play in goal for West Ham, as I told Parksy once, you know. And um, and so I can reel off the Jim Standons. Jim Standon, yeah. there's a West Ham goalie, played cricket for Worcestershire. 
and I always had this fear that he he um he, he might have got confused when the seasons changed and the, the cricket ball came over and he added it. You know, I had all these little theories about West Ham goalkeepers and uh, um, great fondness of them all. And, yeah. Uh, uh, apart from the one before um, Fabianski, yeah, well, yes. well, yeah, well, when he wanted a goalkeeper anyway, was he? So forget that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, carry carry with number two then. Yeah, this all right. All ready for you. Yeah, is this going all right? Is this how you want it? Yeah. This is yeah. brilliant, Rich. Just keep it coming. I'm loving it. I'm just sitting here listening to you talk or anything. It's lovely. Well, number two, uh, I've chosen, and don't forget these are shirt numbers, as I said. Number two, I've chosen John Bond. Yeah. Um, the reason I've chosen John Bond, 440 games for the Hammers, and. Uh, um, and that was before they, you know, were wing backs. Um, Bondy just used to stay at the back and mm. side people if he had to, you know. And uh, and the reason I've chosen him because it was a free kick. Uh, again, again, I was in the chicken run, 1958, and uh, to get promotion, we had to beat Liverpool. And um, and John Bond was called Muffin, not for any connotation, but simply because he had a kick like a mule. And so his nickname was Muffin. And he was a great right back, really good right back. And he, he really took all our penalties. He was a bit race steward, you know, and he was phenomenal at, at free kicks. Yeah. And there was a few minutes to go and it was nil-nil, I think. And uh, and if we'd won, we would have gone into the first division as it was, Premiership now. And free kick, Bondy took it and he smashed this free kick into into the top uh, right hand corner, and West Ham were promoted, and that gave me my first chance to see all the big names coming yes. to, uh, to Upton Park, you know, because it was important to me that free kick because um, uh, the first game of the season when we went into the first division was against Wolves, and Wolves were mighty then. I mean, a really mighty, mighty team. You're talking. Of um, I can almost name the team, but Billy Wright, Ron Flowers, you know Peter Broadbent, these football legends who were all in my magazine, Charles Buckley, yeah. and they were playing at Upton Park, and 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 so I thank John Bond for that. So I have to name him, yeah. uh, and I, I know Kevin as well, but uh, you know it, it's nice to pay tribute, if you like, to some of these forgotten names who are a very long part of of our build if you like to get into out what was then the second division into the first division and see spurs and and john white and bobby smith and dave mckay you know all these legends that i knew about but i'd never seen and it was all down to bondy's free kick so for that i thank you fantastic oh yeah no, this, this is lovely i'm, I'm loving this yeah, <laughs> brilliant carry on you just carry number three he's number three Number three uh, is Frank Lampard, yeah. and uh, and that was an easy one for me. Uh, Frank and I are the same age. Uh, we met a few times, obviously, and uh, really nice guy. And I thought it was time we um, we blessed the name of Lampard, us West Ham fans, because unfortunately that surname has been dragged through the mud a few times. Yes. We all know that. Um, <clears throat> very unfortunately, I think I, I I've always felt sorry for. Uh, Frank Jr. because there was always this little bubble going on um, that that Frank played for West Ham because of his dad, mm. and uh, and that wasn't the case. But in the early days, and I knew Frank Jr. when he was sort of that big, you know, and he was a great player. But there was always this stigma, you know, about yeah. being Frank Senior's son, you know, and all that stuff. But the reason I've chosen Frank Lampard is 551 games, by the way was that we're the same age and we were both born, well, both come from East Ham. And and so Frank Lampard, for me, was that pillar of possibility yes, that, no. that someone from where I come from could actually play genuinely for West Ham United. And he did. And not only that, but he played for England a couple of times. Uh, and so he was really the, um, the bastion of local success. Uh, and so he had to be there. there. There were a few others. Noel Campwell was a good left back, way, 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 way back. 
Um, I don't see, I've struggled to find some more recent left backs, to be honest. I know I'm sounding like I'm a history no, teacher. It's true. Yeah. But it don't matter. I remember when the Dead Sea wasn't even ill. That's how old I am. But I, I just thought, yeah, these are great, great stories. Lampard, a local boy. Because um, uh, John Bond wasn't he? I think he came from further up in Essex or something near Dedham or somewhere like that. Uh, Ferguson, Scottish, you know. So I'm not just picking on the local boys, but Lampard, definitely. Frank Lampard, number three. Yeah, And, and my just... hero at the time. Yeah, and as you said, you live. It's almost like you lived. You know, it, I do that with people who are my age who are maybe famous. You're thinking, God, what could have been? What could have been? I could have been him. And it must be the same with with Frank. You look what you watch him play. Again, that could have been. <laughs> you know, that is me. I'm living. He's living my dream through his. It was living playing. my dream, and yeah. he rolled his socks down. You know, yeah. a bit like Grealish, he just went in for it. You know, none of this nonsense of today. He rubbed his socks down, got on with it, and um, and as we know, danced around corner flags. Good for him. Yeah, good for him. And you're right. I think he's and, and that's what's come through from these from these interviews we have when people have spoke about Frank uh, Senior is you know he's not he's not put in the same bracket as as Billy and Bobby and 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 Trevor and he should be you know five hundred. He said five hundred and fifty odd appearances. You know he's 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 he won on the FA Cup. You know he's like you know it's it's that's what I mean. It's like we just seem to pick and choose who we revere. Do you know what I mean? And I think yeah. you know the word legend is banded around far too much in football. You know someone's a legend and they only played eighteen months at the club, where he played. Years, years and years and years. Yeah, yeah. And and it, it's really weird, isn't it, that these mm. days you you almost, especially young kids, judge a player by their transfer fee. Um, and uh, I think us West Ham boys have uh, seen that that doesn't always work. No. Yeah. <laughs> I'm mentioning your names, but it doesn't work. Or getting in expensive managers as well. doesn't always yeah. work as well. Um, right, okay, moving on, number four. <laughs> Of course, Billy Bonds. Yeah. Billy Bonds is up there, is, is the pinnacle of West Ham servant for me. Um, I, I just looked down on my little things I jotted down. Do you know he was at West Ham 27 years, mm -hmm. taking in all the different roles and, and so on? And you just think, um, and he came from Charlton as well. He didn't start with us. So you just mm -hmm. think, wow, what a servant. And um, Billy, by the way, 663 games. It's astonishing, you know, yeah. and yeah, it'd be sent off every week now. We 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 know that, you know, yeah. uh, and uh, I was trying to. I'm not thinking of Billy Bond. Someone else came came into my mind, you know, because I always remember Billy always used to comfort referees. He used to go and pat them on the back and go, "I'm sorry," and he got away with murder. But he was a, a, an astonishing what we need now type of mm. player, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and and someone else came in, into my head when I was thinking about that it was Keith Robson. Keith Robson used to play alongside Billy Jennings uh, up front. And I think, and I'm, I'm pretty damn sure I'm right, I think Keith, Keith Robson was the quickest booking West Ham ever had, uh, I think, because we were playing Leeds at Upton Park and uh, Leeds kicked off and the ball went um, back to Bremner. And Keith Robson flew into Bremen and <laughs> he broke both his legs and, and got booked. And I think it was four seconds, uh, I think. So how about that? Yeah, That's pretty I mean, impressive. It was, well, him or some, or it was either him or I remember, remember Monks used to do quite well when he came on as, as a sub, didn't they? John Monker, it's almost like you'd count yeah. one, yeah, yeah. two, Funny three. Funny play John Monker. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, I love Good him. Good sense of humour. Yeah, but, brilliant. Yeah, and, and the other interesting thing about Billy Bonds, which you may not know, is that at the time I was living down in Lyme Regis in Dorset because I'd been compulsory purchased by British Airways or whatever when I was living in Essex for Stansted, you know. So I thought, oh, I'm going to live by the sea. And I didn't fancy St. Osef or Jaywick, so uh, um, I went west and moved to Lyme Regis. And um, uh, and at the time, there was uh, like Tony Gow, McAvenny and so on. And, uh, and, and Tony said to me, did you ever see Billy down there? And I went, what, in Lyme Regis? He said, oh, yeah, do you know he's a serious bird watcher? And I went, really? Billy Bonds? This... 
iconic <laughs> beast <laughs> on the pitch at his weekends was going down to a swannery in Dorset, bird watching. And I thought, no, but it's true. And wow. there was that other side of Billy Bonds. He was quiet. He was um, he, he was hard conversationally because he was actually quite shy. Mm. Um, and maybe that's where the management, you know, tickled a bit wrong or, or whatever. But he was, for me, the epitome of a, of a West Ham midfield. Uh, mm. uh, although I think a right back when he joined us, but mm. anyway, irrelevant. But uh, he he ruled, didn't he? He ruled a game, and uh, and he had to be in my eleven purely because yeah. he's a bird watcher. <laughs> yeah, it's just, you're right. He's such a humble, quiet man. Yeah, um, and and when we um when we rightfully obviously named the stand after him um last season we can't remember every season just blended into one at the moment um but recently um you just saw how much it meant to him because a man you know he was quiet but you know even when i mean i i obviously never saw him play but i saw him when he managed and obviously when we went up in 92 and he was standing in the director's box you know there was no it was exciting there was no emo, you know he wasn't a particularly emotional person but no. to see him literally this hard man, you know, I see the, I remember the, the seeing the pictures of him with his, no. yeah, exactly. But I see like the picture of him with his things bandaged up and, uh, you know, smiling with a tooth out and to actually cry and almost, he was crying his eyes out because he, it meant, meant so much to him. And mm. it was just amazing to see, just amazing to see that because, you know, it, it was lovely to see and obviously all the fat, the fans were cheer, cheering, you know, six foot two. And and obviously all the players were there. It was it was a beautiful, beautiful moment. And yeah, yeah it was it was long overdue, but um, but it was, it was good. Moment, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But uh, he is proper West Ham, and and yeah, yeah and, um, and no, you're right. Yeah. You're totally right. Go on, Car carry on. I, like, carry on. I was just reminiscing about Billy Bonds, but I don't really know him, so it's like I don't know <laughs> as much as you. But um, no, he was a he was a, a great shout, and definitely yeah. a big your team. That's for sure. Number five, we go number five now, Richard. Yeah, wearing the number five shirt as well. Um, my old mate Alvin Martin, I've oh, chosen yeah. uh, purely because you couldn't meet a nicer guy. No. Um, he was a real genuine bloke. Well, still is, but I mean, he was a real genuine guy, and um, I loved Alvin a lot. And we always laugh, me and him, because um, our hair has gone the same way, and I, identically the same. Because when he came to, uh, um, to to West Ham originally, he looked like a cross between Leo Sayer and Kevin Keegan, you know, uh, as did I. Um, I haven't always looked like this. I, I just look like this because it's a fashion, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a choice, yeah. Yeah, I'm getting a bit long at the back, but I ain't got a hairdresser. But anyway, um, Alvin came to West Ham and he ended up playing 469 games for us. And I find this astonishing in, in, in modern football that, yeah. that I can reel off these facts that I have to look up, you know, I'm not an encyclopedia. And I just said, 469. And I remember Tony Gale telling me a great story about Alvin, because Alvin came to my house. He wanted to um, start after dinner speaking, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and so we went for a game of golf, and, uh, uh, and I said to him, tell me some funny things. And, you know, Alvin, he's, he's chirpy, but he said, I, I don't know, I don't know. I'm just a footballer, you know, and yeah. not really got many funny stories. <clears throat> and Tony Gal, who was with him, piped in and said, I'll tell you what, Rich, he's got a great story. He said, we were, it was in his testimonial and uh, playing Liverpool and uh, all the players were lined up in the tunnel and uh, humble Alvin was standing there, uh, West Ham against the Liverpool 11 or whatever it was. And uh, Alvin Martin turned to Tony Gow on his own testimonial and said, Tony, all these, all these legends turning out for me, he said, I'm the only one on the pitch I haven't heard of. <laughs> and I just thought that was Alvin Martin. He was a club player and uh, played along Gailey for, alongside Gailey for a long, long time. Yeah. I loved the pair of them. And uh, um, England player, yet again. And... 
the most amazing thing about Alvin is even if you see him today, he's never lost that Scouse accent. No. And uh, I'm sure that if I had gone and lived in Liverpool for as long as he's lived down here, I might have at least got a little bit of apples and pears, you know, and, yeah. and, and all that, but not Alvin. Once a Scouser, always a Scouser. And I'm really, really pleased uh, they brought his boy back. Um, I know he didn't play a lot, but it was it was a, a homecoming, really. Mm. And to see the hug, you know, yeah. um, when he went and hugged his dad, you know, after that nice little debut for the boys, it was great to see Alvin and his son. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally agree. No, I, I totally agree. You know, it, it's it's one of those things. You know, we have we have them. You know, these are what I call the adopted cockneys, and, yeah. and Alvin is an adopted cockney. You, you're right, and he's obviously he's, you know, he, he you know where he lives. <laughs> you know, he, uh, you know, he, his daughter, his, his son, his grandson goes is in the same year as my daughter uh, oh, at school, and he and he he turns up at the school fate with his with his other kid who does the football academy stuff, and you know, and he, he still see him around, and he's he's still got the he's still a, like a lovely guy. And again, with the, the whole Billy thing, when Billy got the stand dedicated after him, Alvin was the PA; he was the one doing it all, yeah. um, and, and rightly so because he's, he's such a lovely guy, and uh, yeah. <laughs> He fits it. He's a scouser. He knows how to nick a hubcap. Come on. <laughs> you said it, Richard. I didn't. And you're, you're mates with him, so you're all right. You get away with things like that. Exactly, yeah. Number six. Who would who'd your number six be? Who would you mm. think? Um, Matthew Upson. The... <laughs> <laughs> he retired the shirt, didn't he? <laughs> um, well, Bobby, obviously... Yeah. Um, I knew Bobby Moore because we worked at Capital Radio together, you know. Oh, wow. And, um, and I was just checking last night that um, uh, Bobby Moore, 544 games for the boys. Mm. And um, and it astonishes me um, because he went into management, didn't he, after Fulham, you know. Mm. And, uh, um, and Bobby Moore was a very, very difficult man to talk to. He was painfully, painfully shy. Um, and you read the stories of him and Jimmy Greaves going out on the razzle and all that, and I just think that's not the Bobby Moore I knew. But the, the greatest story I have of Bobby Moore is a personal one, actually. Um, there's a park near where I lived in East Ham called Goosley Park, and it's right on Beckton Bypass there. And um, and me and my mate Johnny Lacey were, were playing – uh, in the park, like you do as kids, and um, Bobby Moore turned up, and he's in my park because he's Bobby Moore was a barking boy. He, he wasn't an East Ham boy, but he must have been going home down the bypass or whatever. And he saw some kids playing in the park. Bobby Moore, uh, who died on my birthday, unfortunately, um, and he stopped and he came and played football with us. And so me and John Lacey, my best mate at school, we ended up playing football with Bobby Moore. And um, and when I met him quite a few times at Capitol and so on, I said, Bobby, you're not going to remember this, but you stopped your car and you know, you know, Cortina or whatever it was and came and played football with me in Goosley Park. And he went, yeah, you're right. I don't remember. <laughs> um, but... The greatest interceptor, um, Beckham Bar, Moore. They they stand like, in the words of Kamara, like green lighthouses. You know, <laughs> just a phenomenal, phenomenal footballer. Yeah. The time, the timing. You know, the patience, and going in goal even when um, when the necessity arrived with an injury and stuff. Bobby Moore was everything to me. He he was. Uh, uh, the epitome, if you like, of, I was going to say the one club player, but I do sort of see him as, I know he went to Fulham, and I know he joined Bestie and all that, but but I still see him as that sort of bastion, I used the word earlier, of what West Ham was all about. Mm. And um, and if I was, if I had Bobby Moore's eyes and I looked at the West Ham situation today, I would shake my head and mm. I would go, this isn't the club I played for. Mm. And uh, I find that sums up um, my feelings, at least, of what's going yeah. on these days. 
um, it had to be Bobby Moore. Number seven, you're going to be shocked at, though, I've got to tell you. All right, go on in. Let's go number seven. No, I, I don't think he's saying anything else about Bobby Moore. I think you, you've you said it all so eloquently. It's, I, There's I nothing to, to say it. about it. No, it's you not. Know, no. No. Number seven, I thought about a guy who played for us a couple of times called Peter Braybrook, but he played mainly for Lake Orient. And the only reason I thought of Peter Braybrook was he, he was in my brother's class at school, at East Ham Grammar School. Um, but he was uh, pretty crappy, I think. I don't, I don't remember him. But I thought I could at least give him a name check because he knew my yeah. brother. And I thought, that's pathetic. <laughs> um, and number seven is a shock. Uh, I've chosen Alan Taylor. And the reason I've chosen Alan Taylor was because of the 1975 Cup Oops. final. Yeah, of course. And, um, but that's not the only reason. Uh, I think the reason I've chosen Alan Taylor is because he was the skinniest footballer I've ever seen. He had no muscles. Uh, uh, he was a tiny little bloke, came down from Rochdale, and so he was prepared to join any club, let's be honest, when you play for Rochdale, you'll sign with anyone uh, <laughs> to get out of the place. And uh, he, he ends up coming to West Ham, and uh, he was a little wizard, if you like. I think we mm. called him Billy Wiz a couple of times on the chicken run, you know. Um, never went into a tackle because he would break. Uh, but the reason I've chosen Taylor is because he gives us all hope because he's probably, ironically, number seven, the only footballer who had skinnier legs than Harry Redknapp. <laughs> and he used to run up and down that right wing all day, avoiding <laughs> the likes of, you know, the Hunters and the oh, God, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hunters, you know. And um, to have his glory moment um, in the cup final, um, epitomised for me, don't give up. If you want yeah. to be a professional footballer, it don't matter. You don't have to be built like Antonio, you know, and uh, and whatever. You know, you can you can still show show your business. Devon Shear wasn't a big player, you know, by any means. Um, but Alan Taylor had it all against him. He weighed. Uh, I checked this up. He weighed three stone four pounds soaking wet. <laughs> um, never headed a ball because they punched him out of the way. And, uh, and 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 came from Rochdale, so he weren't really in for glory, but he no. got it. He got it, and yeah. and that is for the little kids. Never give up, even if you're yeah. tiny like him. I filmed um, Theo Walcott for a while um, for a production company from when he was nine years old to when he was thirteen, I think, um, before he went to Southampton Academy, and Theo was twice as small or twice smaller than Alan Taylor when he started and I did Theo's first ever interview and he never said a word he was so 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 painfully painfully shy and his dad um, Don um, had one dream for Theo Walcott which was to play for West Ham because Don was a massive Irons fan and uh, at that time he would have been a really really good signing Told Roger Cross about him actually, um, but um, nothing, nothing really transpired, and that was a an interesting time for me because I know Roger from school, uh, you know the West Ham scout and coach, yeah. and um, we were filming two lads. One was called Theo Walcott, and the other was called Adam Lalana, and I said, Rog, check these two out. They're only <laughs> ten years old, and uh, he said, We'll do, and. Uh, Nothing happened, Roger Cross, <laughs> naughty boy. Lalana <laughs> was faster than Theo Walcott as a little 10 year old. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, going off the subject, really. But yeah, nice. Alan Taylor, number seven, yeah. had to be. Yeah. Made it no, out of right now. Cool, eh? <laughs> <laughs> he did quite well for himself, didn't he? Yeah. Considering where he came from. Right, yeah, Alan Taylor. Uh, num number eight, then. Number eight, then. Who's number eight, then, then Richard? Martin Peters. Martin Peters, yeah. Um, and once again, I'm going on shirt numbers. Um, mm. Martin Peters did, was a number eight for a while. Um, this was after the days of Phil Woosnam and so on. And um, there's something special about Martin Peters that is personal, really is that I used to live in Upper Brentwood Road in Gidea Park and yeah. um, uh, number 456, right opposite St John's School. 
And I lived there with a guy called Jazz Summers. I rented a room in his rented. I did the cooking rent free, yeah. um, struggling musician. And um, um, Jazz Summers used to manage me. And I say the term loosely. He worked at Old Church Hospital as a radiographer. So he shut the door and red light went on and he could ring folk clubs and get me gigs. <laughs> and uh, this is all totally true. And um, anyway, one day he said, I can't manage you anymore. I don't really like folk music very much he said i've got a band he said i'm going to uh, i formed a band and i'm going to manage them and i said jazz we we're just making headway you know we're getting gigs and all that stuff he said no nah, i don't want to do it anymore i said it'll be the worst thing you ever do if, if we split up and i said what's your band called he said wham <laughs> and he, he built um george michael and andrew ridgely created wham and dumped me for wham what what a mistake anyway a mistake. We, yeah we lived at four five six upper Brentwood road and most nights um martin peters would park his car outside our house um uh, to wait for his boy at st john's school and uh i met martin peters obviously quite a few times but i remember once we were at the grosvenor celebrating a 1966 dinner and uh yeah bow tie job and all that and i tried to find the photo to stick it up i couldn't find it and uh, i said martin peters he said richard digens and i thought blimey he's heard of me martin peters yeah. now it goes back to when i was at school and we used to go on coach trips to wembley for england schools they would play you know uh, france schools or whatever and uh, martin peters played for dagenham schools and he got chosen for England in the schoolboy team. And so when I was uh, I, just a little kid, I went along to Wembley, you know, my mum gave me the pocket money to go along, sit in the coach, and Martin Peters played in that game. And I told him that, and he went, yeah, I remember that game. I said, I was there, I was there. And I said, I was also there when you used to pick your boy up in Upper <laughs> Brentwood Road. And he said, oh, you should have come and tapped on the window. I said, Martin, the number of times I saw you and I wanted to just go, yeah, would you like a cup of tea? You know, and I never had, I never had the guts, guts to do it. And, um, and he said, you should have done. And I said, and I'm, this is going to sound hugely arrogant, Russ, but I can only tell you the truth. Um, we're in the Grosvenor, bow tied up. And I said, Martin, it would mean the world to me if I could have my photo taken with you because you're my hero martin peters and i swear on the holy bible he said to me richard you're my hero it will be an honor to have my picture taken with you because you are my favorite comedian oh. and i burst into tears i actually I could burst just, yeah i can imagine i couldn't take the photo because my eyes had gone red and horrible and um and for that reason, I know that sounds arrogant, but I just want to say, yeah. I mean, you, you, it, at the end of the day, you're in a position where where you can do that, and and for someone to say that something that to that in a professional capacity, you know, it's that they could say, you know, you're Russ, you're the best sales director of a market research company, you know, and that's, it doesn't really matter. It's all about and mm. what an amazing, amazing thing to happen, regardless yeah, it of was, it was, and uh, I so wish. All them days in Gidea Park. I could yeah. Have, Hi, Martin. Fancy a cup of while you're waiting for your boy. And yeah. I would have got to know him really, really, really well, you know. Um, but a really nice guy. Again, quite a shy guy like like yeah. Bonzo, you know. Um, but and once again, the timing of the man, you know, the perfection of running. We all know what Ramsey said about him, you know, long before he was a chef. And uh, and <laughs> you you just think to yourself, you know. He was right, you know. Yeah. Put Martin Peters out there now. He is one of the players that could easily shine in modern football oh, uh, because he had the time, uh, you know, and the timing. Uh, Martin Peters had to be number eight for all those reasons. I miss him a lot. Yeah, definitely. Okay, we'll put Martin in, and you're right, you know, and it, and it, and again, you know, something I've I've appreciated more since doing this is. Is that is that basically, you know, all, people were doing all these things in, you know, Martin Pierce was doing what he was doing on, 
mud heaps, really, not like yeah. on these bowling greens we have now. And I think there's an appreciation of that um, even more so now. Um, cause going through and looking at all these all these old clips and talking about all these old players, it's um, it's incredible, absolutely incredible. Right. right. Okay, we'll put Martin Peters number eight. Who's going to yeah. be num- Who's going to be number nine then? Clive Best. Clive Best. God bless him. Yeah, God bless him. But there's a good reason for that. Only from a memory point of view. Uh, I saw him for the first time on Boxing Day against Spurs. Uh, but, <coughs> excuse me, Clive Best and I have share a birthday, 24th of February. If anyone's interested, send in a card. Um, but I'm actually two years older than Clyde Best. Um, but same birthday, so yeah, same cake. We shared. Um, and Clyde Best was a total enigma to me. You know, the fact that he, he never ran anywhere but scored goals. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the sort of Heskey of the time. And uh, and yet we loved him. We loved him in the chicken run. And, um, and we obviously hadn't seen many players from that part of the globe, you know. And, and stuff like that. But he was burly, uh, like burly. Um, and he could knock people out of the way if he felt like it. Because if you're talking about the shyness of Peters and the shyness of Bonds, they do pale into significant in, in significance with the shyness of Clyde Best. I mean, he was just a massive animal of a man who was as timid as a mouse, you know. And had he had that little bit more of regression, he would have given us 25, 30 goals a season, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's not really the... Um, the football prowess of Clyde Best that's made me choose that number nine shirt. It's because the, on Saturdays, um, I had a, a, a little ritual, really. I, I had to do my dad's sausage and chips every Saturday. And once I cooked the sausage and chips, I, I, I got my pocket money, um, as I mentioned earlier, and I walked to the White Horse pub in uh, High Street, South East Ham, which was eventually the landlord actually was originally um, ended up being Tommy Taylor, um, but not in my day. And um, and I walked to the White Horse pub, waited for my number 15 bus along Central Park, past the Hammers pub, up to the town hall, turn left down the Barking Road. And as I mentioned earlier, the number 15 bus journey for me was a penny halfpenny. Sometimes I went on it, sometimes I didn't. The reason I used to love to get on the bus and forgo my chips was because, and you're not going to believe this, on match days, Clyde Best used to be on the same bus. That's Uh, incredible. On match days. (laughs) And he genuinely had his boots and his (laughs) shoulders. Imagine. Incredible. Just imagine getting on a bus and Hallers sitting there. (laughs) <laughs> you know or anyone you know and he never spoke to anyone deep in his thoughts and of course he was so big he took up two seats anyway so he couldn't <laughs> and he always used to sit downstairs i always used to go upstairs like kids did but every saturday uh, i would go downstairs and i'd sit close to clyde best who was getting a number 50 bus <laughs> to the match and you just think that can't be true no it was it's mental. Great memory. Incredible. Oh, what a fantastic memory. No, you're right. It's just so bizarre thinking about it. It's, it's even now, you know, when, you, when I'm speaking to some to some experienced fans and, you know, they'd work on the stalls and Frank Lampard have a stall and Harry yeah. would have a stall and John Charles have a fruit stall. And, and you just it's just a different world, absolutely different world. And to, as you said, you know, he, it's the same with, with someone like Devonshire. You know, he used to get on the... Used to get on the train, you know, because he, he never drove, and uh, that's right. It just it's meant absolutely crazy, absolutely crazy. Well, he spent all his train money on greyhounds. That's why. <laughs> there was another number. There was another number eight I was thinking of was Ronnie Boyce. Yeah, um, sixty four Cup final. You know, uh, great moment for, for me as a little boy, <clears throat> but also that um, his mum and dad had a greengrocer's um, just off Haverley Gardens, which is behind South Bank there, um, going down towards sort of Central Park, Lonsdale Avenue, you know. Yeah. And Ronnie Boyce played for East Ham um, Grammar School. 
and uh, and the thought of a local boy whose mum and dad used to sell my mum and dad vegetables. Again, I thought Ronnie Boyce, the boy that did what Richard Digent so so wanted to do. Yeah. But he was a number eight, and I was a number one goalkeeper, so he didn't really figure, you know. So I thought about Boise, but no, I I went with Martin Peters in the end. Yeah. Cool. I've got yeah. number eleven coming up. I know we're going to do ten, but I've got number yeah. eleven is really interesting. Um, okay. But number ten, Trevor, obviously, I, there, there was yeah. no one else that even came into my head. No, but, I can understand that. Yeah. Have you got another number ten that you could sort of put? <laughs> In the- well, again, it's it's again not not in the truest sense, number ten. But obviously, for my era, number ten for me is Di Canio, isn't it? That, that's me. But it's but it's not in the uh, the truest sense of what a number ten is in the in the, the more sort of elder no. years, so to speak. So no, yeah, I know what you mean. I mean, I think the history lesson I'm giving you all, um, <laughs> uh, number ten was inside the left. Exactly. Um, yeah. And very much that inside left, you know, and um, and Trevor Brooking, of course, came through the ropes like like um, came through the system, yeah. if you like. Came from uh, I think he was a Raynham boy, uh, I think, uh, and um, and I saw him way 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 back when uh, I think Trevor started as like a defensive number four. I think I, I certainly don't remember him playing more forward um, when he started out at West Ham and I always felt sorry for Trevor because in the days of long air he tried to grow his hair long and it just didn't work it, it just didn't work he, he looked like a sort of a vicar who was growing his <laughs> hair long to the Beatles and um, I always felt sorry for him and I thought oh Trev you know have it straightened mate have it straightened um, and obviously um, I've known Trevor for many, many, many years and uh, enjoyed numerous conversations with me. I once said to him, um, who's the best player that you know at West Ham? And he said to me, what, coming up or someone about? And I said, no, coming up, who's the boy? Who's the boy that's going to be the new Trevor Brooking? And he went, I'll tell you, there's two. Joe Cole, and the other one, Stuart Slater. He said, those two are top budding West Ham stars. Joe Cole, Stuart Slater. And I I didn't really get it at first, and I started watching, I don't know if you remember him, he always used to come into the area on that sort of 45 degree slant like Trevor Brooking did, you know, um, before giving the nice pass to the goal scorer and so on. And Slater, who I think ended up in Celt- at Celtic, he, he modelled himself on Trevor Brooking and uh, um, never quite made it, I don't think. No. Um, but I think he was at Ipswich and uh, I think there must have been a John Lyle connection. I, I really don't know, I'm just talking off the top of my head. But um, I liked Slater when I watched him, um, loved Joe Cole when I watched him. Um, and Joe Cole should have been the eternal hammer as far as I was concerned. Uh, but uh, he's doing well as a pundit. He's doing great as a pundit. I think, I think yeah. I'd be, he, he, know, he knows his stuff, doesn't he? he Definitely does. knows his stuff. Yeah, he knows his stuff. And he's more intellectual than we are, mate. Let's put yeah. it that way. Um, but Trevor Brooking, yeah, had to be. And yeah. I, did, I, ch- I checked him up and, um, and I couldn't quite remember. Um, I, I put down um, 186 games, but I'm not sure I'm right there. I, you might probably know that. Some, uh, yeah, some, someone will mention it in Richard in the comments, so don't worry about it. Comments, there's going to be loads of them, isn't there? No, Ooh. Um, but it brings me to my number 11, yes. which is the most stupid, bizarre number 11 that I could possibly think of. But it made me laugh when I thought of this guy. Because he's a player that very, very few watching would have heard of, let alone appreciate. And his name was Ken Tucker. Ken I, Tucker. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'd like to tell you about Ken Tucker. <laughs> um, where are we? Yeah. Now then, he made his debut for West Ham, listen to this, in 1947. And he scored a hat trick 
on his debut against Chesterfield. Yeah. How about that? Stupid. Just after the war. But there's a yeah. real significant fact about Ken Tucker that makes him my number 11. Um, yes, um, long gone, of course. Uh, um, but when I used to leave Upton Pass to come out round the bowling and head back down Barking Road to East Town Tunnel, on the left, coming down Barking Road, was a sweet shop where I used to go and get my frozen jubbly and me pink shrimps. And that shop was owned by Ken Tucker. <laughs> Ken Tucker's tuck shop. It was. It was the Ken Tucker tuck shop. Oh, wow. <laughs> and at the top, you know, was Ken Tucker. And I thought, wow, I'm going into a West End footballer's sweet shop. And uh, and so every time walking home, I'd nip into Ken Tucker's sweet shop and, and get me jubbly. But um, I wasn't a great footballer, although I had a late Norian trial. It weren't really. I mean, it was 500 kids running around yeah, Brisbane yeah. Road, you know, and, and they picked one who's got a rich dad or something. And uh, and I never really got a look in. But, but nonetheless, I, I, I played twice for East Ham um, with Roger Cross and with a guy called Raymond Tucker and Ray Tucker, Crossy and me um, were East Ham, red and white, unfortunately, Arsenal, um, but nonetheless, we still put the stuff on. And and so I played football with Ken Tucker's son, uh, as did Roger Cross. And uh, he also used to feed me frozen jubblies. And if <laughs> that isn't qualification to be a top West Ham player, I don't know what is. It's true. I mean, I, I mean, I remember I'm, once. I remember once seeing uh, Paul Kitts in Woolworths in Loughton with a pick, a, a well, a bin bag full of pick a mix, a bin bag. <laughs> no. Yeah. True. No. Yeah. Yeah. So. So there's, 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 there's my eleven, mate. Oh man, it's been amazing. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate all the effort that's gone into that, and everyone will do watching. You know, they love when you when you when you sort of take some time and go through and look at everything. Yeah, it's it's incredible. And every story, what I love is every every player has a story, and 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 it just makes it's it's a lovely. There's there's a book in there, Richard. I think there's a book nah. in there. Yeah, I think so. I think there's a book there, mate. I think so. Um, but. Uh, no, man, it's it's been absolutely a, a privilege talking to you. Thank you so no, much. No, for no, that's all right. It's you know, it it's nice to be West Ham connected because I'm not these days. Um, of course, I'm an avid West Ham person. I have claret and blue blood, um, uh, but uh, I don't see West Ham today sure. as West Ham. I was that brought you supported, up yeah, as a child, yeah. and um, I have no comment to make on the three people. Um, other than I loved Upton Park, yeah, it was, it was my youth. Yeah, and uh, I well, it's where you were from, wasn't it? It's, it's geographically where you were from as well. So there's an emotion. There's not just a, a football tie, but there's you know everything else. You know, as you said, going to Ken Tucker's Tug Shop and getting on the yeah. fifteen bus. It, it's it's the whole package. And so yeah, I mean you know it's it's not the same. It isn't the same. You know we we know it's not the same. It's it's different. And and for some people it's it's some people enjoy it. Some people don't enjoy it, and that, that's that's what it is, unfortunately. And uh, but uh, it's it's been been amazing. It's been it's been lovely having this sort of wander down memory lane, Richard. With you, oh, another time. I'll think of some more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries, Richard. We'll have you on again. And uh, and obviously, thanks everyone for watching. Um, obviously, like, share, subscribe. Uh, and from me and Richard, take care, everyone. Stay safe. We'll see you again very very soon. And come on, you eyes. Big game tonight. Come on, you wines. <laughs> Take care, man. Bye-bye.